uh, I'll, I'll give some of the introductions here. So um, for this uh, session, we'll have uh, four presentations, starting with um, the, the speakers here. Um, I have, so for, for uh, Dr. Elizabeth Bielski, uh, she is a senior pharmacologist working at the Division of Therapeutic Performance I, Office of Research and Standards, Office of Generic Drugs, Center of Drug Evaluation and Research at the FDA since October uh, 2022. Uh, prior to her role as a senior pharmacologist, she served as a pharmacologist from October tw uh, 2020 to October 2022, and as a chemist from January 2020 to October 2020 within DTB1. Her areas of expertise involve orally inhaled and nasal drug products and drug device combination products, and she is actively involved in developing gener uh, uh, general and uh, product-specific guidances. Uh, she addresses control correspondences, pre-ANDA meeting requests, citizen petitions, internal consults, um, and collaborates on a lot of uh, different uh, research projects to promote uh, generic drug development for these products. Prior to joining the FDA, she served as an ORISE fellow at F, uh, within the FDA from 2018 to 2019, and she completed her PhD in chemical engineering from Wayne State University um, in uh, 2018, encompassing work uh, also conducted at the Department of Chemistry at the University of uh, Sao Paulo, uh, and the Department of Pharmaceutics at, at uh, VCU. Uh, and this was related to, to novel drug delivery strategies for treatment of lung cancer and lung uh, metastases. Prior to receiving her doctorate, she received her Bachelor in Science in Biomedical Physics uh, honors uh, with, with university honors in 2011 and her Master's in Science in Biomedical Engineering from, in 2012 from Wayne State University. Um, Dr. Uh, Gunther uh, Hokas received his PhD in uh, 1984 at the Institute of uh, Pharmaceutical Chemistry uh, at Willems University. Uh, he completed a, a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco, and subsequently joined the University of Florida's College of Pharmacy as an assistant professor in 1987, where he continues to serve as a professor of pharmaceutics Dr. Hawkes' research is, uh, is interested in, in the evaluation of inhalation drugs through in vitro and pharmacokinetic dynamic approaches. He collaborates with regula uh, regulatory authorities to improve methodology for drug approval of uh, general, uh, generic inhalation drugs. And he's also a fellow of uh, APS and the American College of Clinical Pharmacology. In 1998, he received his recipient of the Young Investigator Award of the German Airway and Lung Research Society and received a a a ACCP's Tonneby Young Investor, uh, Investigator Award. He was awarded the University of Florida's Foundation Research uh, Professorship uh, from 2015 to 2018 and 2019 to 2022. Uh, the American College in Clinical Pharmacology Bristol Myers Squibb's uh, Mentorship and Clinical Pharmacology Award in 2019 and is an honorary recipient of a ACCP. In 2022, he received the Charles G. Thiel Award for Outstanding Research and Discovery in Respiratory Drug Delivery. Uh, he's published more than 240 research papers. And Dr. Susan Bach is a pharmacokineticist in the inhalation therapy one. She's responsible for the development of product-specific guidances for generic drug development and reviewing and responding to controlled correspondences, consults, uh, and pre-ANDA meetings. Dr. Bach is also engaged in regulatory science uh, research initiatives related to these products um, in the Gadufa Science Program. Uh, she has a, a BS degree in biochemistry from the University of California, Los Angeles, and a pharmacist from VCU. Prior to joining FDA, she spent eight years in the pharmaceutical industry on a variety of inhalation drug products uh, at different stages of development. Um, and finally, uh, the last uh, but not least is Dr. Martin Svensson. Uh, he is currently holding a position as, as CEO at Amasi uh, Consulting, uh, which he founded in 2011. Prior to his, this position, he worked at AstraZeneca for 13 years as associate principal scientist within inhalation technology and, ha and has during this time worked with particle sizing using different approaches such as lung dose prediction models, infection uh, methodology, fast screening methods, and various other automation projects, and device development of dry powder inhalers. For several years, he has, uh, he has been a member in industry-wide organizations such as EPAG, as well as the Cascade Impactor Working Group of IPAC-RS. Um, Mar Dr. Martin has a PhD in surface and colloid science and has published several art articles, po posters, and book chapters in the inhalation field. So with that, we'll turn back to uh, Dr. Elizabeth Bielski for her to give uh, her presentation. So thank you.
right. Thank you, Dr. Newman, for such a lovely introduction. All right, I'm going to kick off this um, uh, some session one, um, talking about considerations and challenges uh, for dissolution testing of orally inhaled drug products. Again, general disclaimer, these are my views and not the FDA's views or policies. Um, to begin, uh, as we've been talking a lot about today and what Brian um, really went into depth is, we know developing generics for locally acting MDIs and DPIs is challenging because of the multiple factors that can influence drug delivery to the site of action. In this case, I'm really focusing on only one aspect here, which will be the dissolution. Um, again, and as Brian mentioned before, we have um, multiple alternative approaches um, that we've suggested in some of our product specific guidances for solution MDIs. That, provide, that may help provide a foundation to ensure equivalence at that local site of action. Here, really, I'm only focusing on one of many, and I know we're, hopefully we'll get to talk about multiple aspects of this, um, and really this illusion is the main, main aspect I want to cover um, in this short talk. Um, at its most fundamental element, dissolution is that process of, by which the drug is dissolved in some sort of solvent, vehicle and we really try to understand the rate at which it dissolves so i'm sure all of you are aware of that but how does that come in the context of inhalation drugs products um in in that case dissolution we can look at it more from the terms of it being useful for multiple factors either as a product quality control tool we can use it for bioequivalence ass assessment we can use it for establishing in vitro or in vivo correlations or input into in silico models so when we think of dissolution of inhalation products, it is really dependent on multiple fa facets. Um, we do rely heavily on the API particle size distributions. That's going to impact your dissolution, um, which you highly dependent on understanding your formulation of your drug product. Um, you also have to consider the physical chemical properties of the API and excipients that are involved, which is also highly dependent on your formulation of the drug product. Um, in, in turn, we also have to think about the APIs and excipients and their interactions with each other. And in that case, you not only think about your formulation, but your device comes into play in, in this area as well. Um, last but not least is your region of lung deposition of the API. We know that where the, the um, API ends up landing in the lungs is a huge factor in how it will be dissolved. Um, so here, you not only have the formulation device that you have to think of, but you also have to think of the, how the patient's using that product and also the patient factors, including the disease state, the region of the lungs it's at, where are they at, the age, and, and et cetera. So you can see how this becomes a very multifaceted process and dissolution is impacted by all these factors. And there's multiple things to consider from your formulation all the way up to the patient. So, of course, there's a lot of challenges in this area of dissolution, right? Our main one is that there hasn't been any standardized or sensitive dissolution methods for inhalation products. There are many standardized dissolution methods that happen for other dosage forms, but we've, we really haven't had one that's been standardized in this re area. So over the many, many years, um, our GADUFA research program has tried to set its goal to um, develop in vitro dissolution methods for orally inhaled drug products that would be capable of predicting the in vivo dissolution of drugs. In, in, in doing dissolution, we really want to gain a better understanding of what the formulation factors are and how dissolution is impacted, thereby facilitating any potential in vitro and vivo relationships. So what's going on happening at the once it reaches its site of action, um, the local availability and, and subsequent systemic PK um, um, aspects. Also, you know, it could be a quality by design tool, right? Not only for bioequivalence, but for your formulation develop and product quality control. So over the many years that the, the we've funded research, we've had several external grants and contracts that are either were specifically um, looking into developing dissolution methods uh, for inhalation products or um, 
dissolution was one of the many in vitro methods that was included in the research projects. So you can see it's a very um, ongoing um, area that um, oh, the FDA has been trying to look into, especially for alternative approaches. So I'm going to talk about some of the successes we've had over the years when it comes to using dissolution. We have been able to develop sensitive methods, and we've been able to see that there are um, multiple methods have been shown successful to um, capture differences in formulations. For example, we've here are two different methods that were developed showing that you can capture differences in um, MDI and DPI um, of the same drug product, but you have different um, formulations made. Not only that, you are able to capture API particle size and excipient differences. Um, as well as seeing sometimes your dissolution profile is also going to change because of an absence or presence of specific APIs in the same dosage form. So you can see here, it is possible to make in vitro dissolution work in inhalation space, and there are multiple ways to do it. Um, and so we can show that it, it can be sensitive to showing formulation differences. And another project you can see when you combine in vitro dissolution with um, other in vitro techniques to really understand that microstructure of your drug formulation, you can, you can really un start to understand what is going on um, in your product performance. Um, here is just one example of when we looked at um, combining MDRS um, to understand how the uh, API is agglomerated to the lactose, you, you could see that the agglomeration state impacted the dissolution profile. And these were um, based on evaluating US and EU marketed products. So in this case, you can see show that it does show a lot of utility. And when combined with other techniques, you really can start to really under fundamentally understand your drug product better. <clears throat> um, now we can see about dissolution and PK. How can we tie these two things together? Um, again, dissolution has a potential of correlating to systemic PK. Um, and one study that we had conducted with multiple research groups um, was looking at different fluticasone propionate DPI formulations. Here, I'm just talking about three formulations that were manufactured using the same API batch, but different lactose binds. Um, in that case, there was formulation A, B, and C. Um, formulation A differed in its aerosol performance. In this case, we're going to just focus on looking at that it had a higher MMAD value compared to the other two. In this case, we also ran the dissolution on that. And you can see the dissolution behavior of the X throat fraction um, did differ for that one um, formulation A, especially having um, a lower dissolution rate compared to the others. Um, again, two different methods were used. Um, even though the method showed a little bit differences in sensitivity, um, they both showed similar trends. Um, so when we tested this in subjects to measure the PK performance, we also saw differences in that formulation A. Um, hence, you, you can see where dissolution start starting to bridge that gap between your aerosol performance and the systemic PK. So it's a very valuable tool. It has been useful. And we can see multiple methods can be used. In addition to another way of looking at trying to correlate um, your dissolution to systemic PK, um, we've also tried to look at other ways to use the dissolution curve and evaluate it. Um, in this case, we, um, the analysis was shown that if you look at the dissolution half-life for different inhaled corticosteroids, you can link it to your amine absorption tie from PK. And so there is some good correlations you can make to really understand that your dissolution may impact what you see systemically in the PK measurements. <laughs> so lessons learned. We have de um, Develop sensitive dissolution methods that were capable of understanding formulation factors that impact dissolution. Dissolution can be a link between product formulation factors and bioavailability, and it can establish IV IVCs with PK metrics. So, what are some ongoing questions that we still have? Um, different dissolution methods were shown to have value, but which method is best to use? And is more than one method or variation in method conditions warranted? Can methods be too discriminatory or sensitive, hence not bioirrelevant? Just because you can show discrimination, does it really matter that it, when, when it, the drug reaches the site of action, hence it's 
what's the bioreligant of that, even if you see those differences. Now that I've shown some of our research outcomes, I'm going to dig a little deeper in terms of um, the actual method itself um, and some of the validation and assessment, um, kind of where we stand and some questions I want to pose to, dis to garner some discussion later on this afternoon. First one is the sample collection. So we know that for what makes dissolution a little different from other dosage forms is you really want to collect the aerosolized fraction. Um, you can do this by collecting everything that exits the device using something like a DUSA. Um, you can collect something um, like an extort fraction using something where you um, collect the fraction after passing it through an anatomical mouth throat model. You can use different cascade impactors. So if you want to capture certain aerosolized fractions, um, using cascade pack impactors can be used. Um, or you can find them using some more specialized system that was uniquely designed um, to capture more of a, an ISM um, dose from your NGI, but also helping uh, um, evaluate some of the challenges when you do the sample collection, which is your dosing effect. Um, the ADC was designed specifically to help with that and shown to be proven that you don't have to necessarily worry about your dosing effect in the curve, but for the other sample collections, you have to ensure that no matter how many actuations you have, how that um, you have to control that because the amount of actuations will determine the agglomeration status on those filters. So something to really pay attention to. Now, as I mentioned, what are our ongoing questions in this area? Well, what is the most relevant fraction in, um, to collect, right? We, there's multiple ways to look at it and multiple fractions you could collect. So should we be focusing on collecting the whole dose that comes from the device or more specifically, specific aerosolized fractions on the cascade stages? Or should we be doing more than one? Um, I think maybe your choice will depend on the purpose of the goal of your dissolution measurement. So like, what are you trying to get out of your dissolution? Try and understand formulation differences, or you're trying to establish links to PK, or are you really trying to put inputs to silico models? Now we look at dissolution apparatuses. Any dissolution apparatus you choose should be fit for purpose. Remember that dissolution is really tying understanding your formulation factors um, and trying to tie those into in vitro and vivo correlations. So in this case, you can see that multiple types of dissolution apparatuses not really specifically designed for inhalation, but have been utilized to evaluate inhal inhalation products have been uh, studied. And, and each of these have critical things to consider. Again, when you look at a paddle over disc, you're running all your dissolution under sink conditions. Um, others maybe are diffusion controlled apparatuses like your trans well or your France diffusion well <coughs> cell, excuse me, your France diffusion cell. In that case, you really have to pay attention to how the diffusion's happening in those um, type of apparatuses um, to really to pay attention to. Again, then other, other choices could be flow through systems where you're really paying attention to where you have some sort of sync condition, but the flow is happening through the, through the apparatus. Um, so what I want to ongoing questions here is um, there, there are different types of apparatuses. They all have their unique um, advantages and disadvantages, should we be paying attention to running things under certain conditions? Do we really need to run everything under sync versus non-sync? Should we have diffusion properties placed in there or not? Um, or does it really matter? Um, are these apparatuses comparable when they show their dissolution behavior? So could we, could we show that you could pick one or two and they would be comparable? Um, do they have comparable sensitivity and discriminatory ability? Um, so if, if so, then maybe you could use more than one, or does it really matter? Um, again, we always want to look at which one is going to be your most biorelevant, right? Um, there are some advantages showing you want something that's going to be more representative of what you're trying to measure. So again, maybe that's the way we should go rather than just choosing one that will work. Um, again, there may be advantages and disadvantages. So really understanding which one you choose um, would be something you have to consider. Now, dissolution media. We know the choice of dissolution media should be optimized to be discriminatory and bioavailable. So which one should you include? Um, again, 
you, we, we know that you're going to look at buffers or in, in different types of surfactants or the concentration of surfactants. You could use something more biorelevant as well. Um, in such cases, simulated lung fluid has been used. Um, the ongoing questions here really lie into optimization of your dissolution media will be product dependent. We know that, right? You're going to have to optimize depending on the product, but can you find a balance between um, what is most discriminatory and what is most biorelevant? And so again, we know that use of buffers and surfactants will allow for optimization to be discriminatory, but are they the most physiologically relevant? Again, now you're facing, you could use something like simulating lung fluid, and it could be more physiologically relevant, but could you get that media to be um, discriminatory for your purpose, especially when you're considering biocovalence assessment? So there is always a balance to try to find, and it may depend on the purpose of your dissolution. <clears throat> when it comes to method validation, um, we expect this solution method to be proper, properly validated and robust. Again, right, the whole idea is you want your method to be predictable. You want the correlation between your formulation factors, dissolution, and in vivo performance. You need to demonstrate your method is discriminatory and sensitive. Um, in, in certain ways, you, you, need, you could do that by comparing dissolution profiles either on stress samples or formulations that are intentionally manufactured with meaningful variant variations for the most relevant critical manufacturing variables, right? The ultimate goal of showing your discriminatory capability is to understand the release mechanisms of your drug product and, and show that your dissolution procedure can show the change in those criti critical quality attributes of the drug product. So what are the ongoing questions here? Well, what are the best practices to demonstrate the robustness and discriminatory ability of your dissolution method for inhalation products? Should be ranging API particle size? Should we be looking at changes in formulation, meaning you change your excipient ratios? Or should we really focus on looking at stress conditions? Um, ideas in this area to figure out maybe which is the best way to do that um, are still warranted. When it comes to bioequivalence assessment, of course, we'd love to see you have to model an entire dissolution profile, right? Otherwise, um, we would be stuck um, asking you to do that. Again, you, you need to choose the appropriate statistical analysis for BE. And generally speaking, uh, if anyone who runs dissolution will know, we have model independent and model dependent pathways to, to model the dissolution. You know, most commonly used when you have a common dissolution profile is a similarity factor here. Um, but we also can use um, assessments to establish IVIVCs. And in that case, you can look at maybe other things to consider, such as mean dissolution time. And you can use that to hopefully correlate your in vitro dissolution rates to your in vivo absorption rates. Again, as I mentioned earlier in our research contracts, we have shown that dissolution half-life can be correlated to PK mean absorption time. So what are ongoing questions here? Is there something we may be missing when we're evaluating or comparing our dissolution profiles? Is there another way we could try to look at the data and show some comparisons, either through bioequivalence bio assessment or through our IVIVCs? Now, the agency also has ongoing dissolution methods. And um, we are trying to look at, keep continuously looking at improving on dissolution for inhalation pro, um, products. Um, and right now we have an ongoing contract with inhalation, science, in, inhalation sciences um, looking at their dissolve it system. And this uh, system is highly uh, specialized, a dissolution model. And they simulate the physiological conditions of the lung and mimics the PK data of inhaled particles. So their, their system is uniquely designed to really try to mimic what you get um, in PK concentration. So you're really trying to establish an IVIVC here. So currently we're trying to really consider this system to see if we can do that. Does it have the potential to establish that? Is it sensitive and discriminatory enough to the formulation differences? And can we validate it um, and have it connect to in vivo PK results? So this contract we have is currently ongoing and we're hoping to see what we can develop for the future on that. Again, the agency is always open to develop novel dissolution methods. 
great way, as I mentioned many times already today, our pre and meet product development meeting process is a really good way to interact with us. Um, also come talk to us at public workshops and meetings. Um, have, you know, if you want to investigate a research project with us, you can always do that and or meet us at scientific conferences. So some thoughts to consider. So what have we learned so far? We know that dissolution provides a link between product performance and regional bioavailability and can help establish potential IV IVCs to systemic PK performance. We know that more than one method has been shown to be discriminatory and sensitive. But what are some ongoing questions that maybe we can consider um, looking more into? And some that are kind of tied to the dissolution method itself. Should the entire aerosolized dose or a more specific aerosolized fractions or both be the focus of assessment? What kind of conditions should we do our dissolution at? Should we look at sink and non-sink conditions or more flow through conditions? Um, when we're trying to choose our apparatus. What are the best practices to demonstrate a robust and discriminatory dissolution method? And are, are there any additional parameters we haven't considered yet, either for bioequivalence assessment or for establishing IVIVCs? Now, the other ongoing questions is really what, what role does dissolution play for bioequivalence bio assessment of MDIs and DPIs? Another question I want to pose out there is really is dissolution necessary to evaluate for every MDI and DPI drug product? We know that the dissolution properties are very highly dependent on the formulation and the API physiochemical properties. Some are going to be dissolution limited, some are going to be more diffusion limited, or you're really going to rely on that permeability being your limiting factor. So there may be cases we maybe should start thinking about when is dissolution necessary to value to evaluate versus when it may not necessarily be the case. Should dissolution serve as a more of a primary standalone BE tool or a quality control tool as pivotal evidence? Or should we really start thinking of dissolution as more of a supportive role that can help you establish your IVIVCs and in silico methods? Or should it be both? Or is it something we have to look on a case by case basis? You know, the method that you develop may, um, may depend on the purpose your dissolution serves as part of the alternative BE approach. So again, it's something you have to consider early on. And then another thing I want to pose and think about are, are there other supportive physiologically relevant models we could use? For example, there are in vitro and ex vivo respiratory models that could be more suitable uh, to consider when attempting to establish IV IVCs or inputs to your incidental models. Again, dissolution does model the dissolution well, um, but it doesn't capture other physiological parameters um, that may be irrelevant to lung absorption. So we may want to consider you know, other techniques that could fill that gap. I'd like to acknowledge everyone here, um, either at FDA or our external research collaborators, who put all their efforts over the years of what we fundamentally have learned about dissolution in this area and have um, continued to work with us to really hope garner this in this approach. Uh, thank you very much. Are you going to pull up the slides? Okay, great. There they are. Thank you very much. Thanks, Elizabeth, for the great talk. And uh, there will be a little bit of overlap, but I don't think there will, that will be too bad. Great. So um, all the results that I'm going to show are in collaboration. Uh, we have lots of discussions with the FDA. Uh, some of the data were also generated at uh, Emmaus. Um, and let's just dive into it. So this is just a brief summary why I think uh, dissolution might be important. And let's also consider for what kind of drugs uh, it might be important. So uh, everybody knows that dissolution will be affected by particle size. And so if we talk about generic and um, innovator drugs, differences in particle size might be uh, 
relevant and might be actually detected uh, through uh, the solution tests. Um, Elizabeth already talked about sync and non-sync conditions. And so in vivo, the dissolution rate actually might be also be affected by the actual dose that we maybe have in the central areas of, of the lung. So if the doses will be different for some of those drugs that dissolve under sync conditions, um, then the dissolution rate also will be different. Um, the physiology of the airways really will determine um, the dissolution properties. Uh, more central deposition of the drug will result in, for lots of those drugs, under non-sync conditions, so it will be a relatively slow dissolution, while uh, if the drug is being deposited more peripherally, uh, this dissolution, even for relatively lipophilic drugs, might happen very, very fast, within minutes. So we have distinct differences um, in those dissolution rates across the, the lungs. Uh, the lung lining fluid, of course, uh, will be the medium where the drug will dissolve, and those characteristics will be uh, affecting the dissolution rate. And then I put also in the clearance mechanism, the mucociliary clearance. So if our drug dissolves relatively slowly in the central portions of the lung, uh, the mucociliary clearance will determine how much drug actually will survive and will be able to dissolve and uh, induce the desired effect in the central regions of the lung. So again, dissolution is, is uh, very, very important uh, for how much drug will not only be deposited, but how much drug will dissolve and will be able to induce the effect. Uh, Elizabeth already talked a little bit of, of the different systems that we can take a look at. And uh, we have to divide between the, what I call sample preparation and the um, actual dissolution experiment itself. Um, I've listed them here, um, the DUSA, certain stages on the cascade impactor that we could look at at the dissolution rates, and then uh, sample preparation techniques that probably will capture more the fine particle dose. Uh, so that might be this uh, precise inhaled system. Uh, modified cascade impactors have been uh, employed where maybe just one stage is being used, stage one, and then uh, one will collect. And then um, also the anatomical throats. Uh, the solution systems, yeah, the USP system, the transfer system, and the uh, dissolve it I've just listed here. Um, I'm going to present some data that were generated in, in our lab. Um, and so in our system, we use predominantly the anatomical throat to capture essentially the dose that is able to get through the mouse throat region and, and could enter the lung. Um, and so we have those uh, anatomical throats. Most of the time we use the VCU throat. Um, then we just have a filter paper underneath there and we collect the uh, dose that gets through the mouse throat model, um, and we can then do the dissolution test. Uh, we have done some experiments where uh, the mouse throat model was not only used with a constant flow, but where we also um, changed the inhalation profile. We're going to uh, show some results of there. So once we have collected the dose um, through the anatomical throat, uh, we either use the USB system or the transfer system. And Elizabeth already said they really differ significantly. Uh, the USP pedal over disc method uh, uses a relatively large volume of dissolution medium, which means one works most of the time under sync conditions. Um, we've collected the drug on filter paper, and uh, we did those USB experiments with the drug being in direct contact with the dissolution medium. So they don't the drug doesn't have to dissolve and then diffuse across the uh, filter paper, but it can just right away uh, dissolve in, into the uh, dissolution media. Um, and then the transfer system, that's a volume limited approach. So the drug dissolves in a relatively small volume in the uh, system. Uh, once it's dissolved, it has to diffuse across a membrane and then enters the receptor medium. So we have two processes involved, which kind of mimics what's, what's happening um, in the lung. 
And uh, in our hands, um, for most of the drugs that we looked at, the transfer system works under non-sync conditions. So it's a much, much slower dissolution time, um, which my students didn't like because those experiments went over 24 hours. <laughs> Okay, uh, just some observations that we did with the USB pedal over disk system. Um, I said it works under sync conditions. And even drugs like um, udesonide, which is relatively lipophilic, uh, dissolves under those conditions very, very fast. So if we used our typical USB setup where the drug was directly in, in contact with the dissolution medium, um, we started first with 0.3% uh, tween, which we normally used. And uh, Simon Berger, my student, came back and said, well, it dissolves right away. So we just reduced the, um, the surfactant concentration. And even just in PBS, our budesonide dissolved very, very fast uh, within one or two minutes. Um, so we needed to essentially for this drug use a little trick and turn around the, uh, the filter paper uh, and that slowed down the dissolution process and we were able to uh, measure relatively good concentration time profiles. Uh, so that might be one challenge for some of the drugs in the USB system that the drug just dissolves um, too fast. Um, the problem with the transfer system is that we, as I said, we work under um, sync conditions, relatively slow absorption. And when we started, and, and Jack Shure also in, in, in his lab uh, first hypothesized that this dose effect that we saw actually was due to the fact that we at that time collected our sample through a cascade impactor and the drug uh, kind of accumulated underneath those nozzles and forming small little mountains. Um, and so we first hypothesized that this dose effect that we saw might be due to that fact, uh, but it was not. So um, the mouse throat model that we used uh, allows us to deposit the drug uniformly on the filter paper. But even in this case, uh, we saw this dose effect. And, and the dose effect is purely there because uh, we, we work under non-sync conditions. We can, we can modify a little bit the experimental conditions of, of our transfer system, and we can reduce that, as you see on the, on the right-hand side there, uh, by using a little bit larger volumes and specifically larger sample volumes, uh, but it really didn't go away. Uh, we think it's actually not too bad because that's also going to happen uh, in the lung, in the central portions of the lung. And so one could make maybe the comparison that the USB system kind of has conditions that are more representing the peripheral part of the lung and the transfer system more the more central portions of the lung. But we, we definitely have to uh, live with this dose effect and also computer simulations where we try to mimic uh, the transfer system, system uh, showed exactly uh, those relationships and those are the the dotted lines there that I showed on the left and right diagram. Um, just some other practical questions. Um, what kind of solubility should we use in those systems? We normally in our lab, we use either tween <coughs> or SDS, and we kind of can dial into the solubility of the drug that we want to have. Um, and on the left upper portion, you see some experiments that we performed uh, where the solubility of, I think in this case it was mometazone furate, was uh, 20 microgram per ml. And you see that we have difficulties um, to differentiate between uh, stage four and stage six material that we collected on an MGI. Um, if, when we reduce the solubility to five microgram per ml, so reduce the surfactant concentration, then you can see that um, the sensitivity to detect differences in particle size are just much better. And so we normally run nowadays our experiments uh, with solubilities of the API that we look at between one and five microgram per ml. And that for the uh, particle size that we are 
using in those systems that worked in our hands quite well. And uh, computer simulations also seem to uh, confirm that. Um, the next question is also, when should we use actually the solution tests? And um, what, what you see here is, again, some computer simulations where we use different APIs that have different solubilities, let's say in, in aqueous systems, just PBS buffer. And um, so that is here for the Transvaal system and the bluish, blackish uh, looking line all the way to the left, uh, that is just solution. So it takes some time in the transfer system also for something that already dissolved to just diffuse across the membrane into the receptor compartment. And then we just did simulations that just differ in the solubility of the API. Um, and so we simulated those results. We then did the F1, F2 test. And in, in our hands in those simulations, um, if the solubility was higher than uh, 45 microgram per ml, uh, the F1, F2 test would say that the dissolution profiles are similar to that of a solution. So if the solubility of, of those drugs reaches, let's say 45 or 50, at least for the Transvaal system, it's, it's gonna be very, very difficult to um, see a difference between solution and those drugs that have to dissolve. So, uh, solubility below those 50 microgram per ml, then we see a difference between uh, the API in solid form and the API in, in solution. And I've just listed here on the right hand side, just a list of solubilities uh, of the different um, APIs that might be relevant. And the ones that, uh, that were bolded have such high aqueous solubilities that it's probably not worthwhile doing actually dissolution tests because the probability that the result will be equivalent to that of a solution will be very, very high. Um, what surfactant should we use? So I, I said that we use the surfactants to dial into solubilities that we want to have in this uh, dissolution systems. And these here are results that were done by Martin Swenson's uh, team at Amos. And uh, he looked at the dissolution profile of Flovent and Adware. And we looked at fluticasone and propionate only. And we used uh, one time uh, a solubility of one microgram per ml. And another set of experiments, uh, we used, not, we used uh, one time tween and the other time STS. Uh, and the question was just, uh, would the results with tween be different than the results with SDS. And yes, there's some variability in it, but uh, we believe that the important parameter to look at for selecting a surfactant and surfactant concentration is, is purely the solubility of the API. Um, so if we adjust tween and SDS so that they produce the same solubility of the API, results will be very, very similar. And you see that in those results here that uh, uh, whether we use tween or SDS uh, on the left hand side, uh, they provide uh, one microgram per mm solubilities. Uh, the results for Flovent would be very similar uh, and the results for the ADVA experiments would be very, very similar. And again, I just wanna point out that actually the dissolution profiles of Flovent and ADVA, they differ. Um, but the choice of the surfactant really didn't make any differences in the results. Uh, we also used or tried to use uh, a more bio-relevant dissolution medium. Uh, quite often when here's critique, while well, you do your dissolution tests in very, very synthetic dissolution media, tween or SDS, uh, shouldn't you use more bio-relevant materials uh, that are, for example, present uh, in the lung. One could use Cervanta, um, but I think it would be so expensive that you really couldn't do any uh, good experiments uh, with that material. It just costs 
but the costs are just too high. So in our experiments here, we thought to use uh, albumin because that's also present in, in the lung lining fluid. Um, don't ask me why. So we did the same experiments. We determined the solubility or the, the uh, albumin concentration that would give us a one or five microgram uh, per ml solubility. Uh, and my hypothesis was that they should give the same results as our tween and our SDS, the experiments that I just showed in the previous slide. Something happened there. I don't know whether the albumin uh, was denaturated and, and just slowed down the dissolution process, but uh, the results were just not very, very informative. So um, if we look at the more optimized system, again, when I say optimized system, it's probably just using conditions where the solubility is between one and five microgram per ml. Um, I show here just some results with the USP pedal method and the transfer system. I think Elizabeth showed the, the, the identical results. So those are the three formulations that were uh, developed by Jack Schur at University of Bath at the time, I believe. Um, so those were fluticosum propionate DPI formulations where the API was the same. Three different formulations. The FP, the fluticosum propionate, came out of the same bottle. Um, the only thing that Jack changed were the lactose fines. And uh, for that PK study that we were interested in, we did that to ensure that the dissolution rate should be the same because we didn't want to have any effects of differences in dissolution rate in our subsequent PK study. But, uh, uh, at least for me, not being a formulator, I was very surprised that those three formulations showed actually different dissolution rates. Um, and that was purely due to the factors, uh, the lactose fines and, and presume, presumably, and Jack probably can say a bit more about it, that the agglomeration world was somewhat different so that the active surface area of those FP formulations were somewhat different. And we saw um, three, di three um, different dissolution profiles that differed. In our hands, the transfer system showed the, the biggest uh, differences, but on a semi-quantitative level, the USP results were also relatively similar. Uh, we can then use those dissolution profiles or the information from those dissolution profiles to not only look uh, at the picture and say, yes, there are differences. We can actually extract quite a bit of information out of it. So one can use just uh, simulation modules and use the dissolution experiments to extract the relative particle size differences, for example. Um, and those, this kind of information could be put, let's say, into uh, PBPK models so that we don't use the if we do a PPPK model that we use the NGI cascade impactor data for deposition, but that we use those dissolution experiments for um, particle sizes relevant for the dissolution process. Um, and these here are some results. So we, on one hand, use those uh, dissolution tests to come up with the mean dissolution time. And um, we also looked at the PK study that Elizabeth showed relevant to those three formulations. And we also got the absorption half-life from the, I think in this case, it was the um, central lung from, from PK studies. And you see there's roughly a, a relatively good agreement so that the formulation that was dissolving the slowest at the largest mean dissolution time also shows, showed the longest absorption half-life. So there's a certain relationship um, between the solution and the absorption half-life in this case for the central lung. And Jürgen Bolita will give a little bit more information on the PK analysis of this data tomorrow. Okay, so um, we were kind of interesting also to look at how sensitive this method is. So these here are some experiments where we changed the sample preparation methodology. 
Uh, I said that in most of our experiments, we use the VCU throat to uh, collect the sample. Uh, here we used a whole range of, of different throats, so the OPC, uh, the uh, Alberta throat, and the VCU throats in different sizes. And what you really can see is that depending on what kind of throat we used, dissolution picked up differences in the dissolution rate. Um, so the dissolution methodology is really sensitive to, to detect those differences uh, of throats that we used. And so you also can see um, or can speculate that different mouse throat um, geometries in, in subjects and patients actually will result in different dissolution rates or might result in different uh, dissolution rates in, in vivo. Uh, we found relatively good, uh, or we, we could show that uh, there was a relationship between the MMAD that we measured uh, coming out of those throats uh, and the mean dissolution time. Uh, we didn't see a very, very big effect of the inhalation profile. So we used, uh, we simulated inhalation profiles, uh, weak, medium, and strong inhalation profiles uh, within those. <coughs> uh, uh, systems and the effect was relatively minor. Um, you've seen that also in Elizabeth's talk. So the mean dissolution times that we observed um, correlated quite well with the mean absorption times that uh, one uh, got through PK studies. So just re-emphasizing the relevance of those dissolution tests uh, for the fate of the drug. Uh, in the lung. Um, just one more case study. Uh, so in this case, we looked at uh, nasal formulations of metazone furaate, and uh, the formulation again was done by Jack Schur's uh, group in, in Bath. Um, so we had two formulations, uh, mometazone furaate one and two that differed in the particle size. And we did uh, the dissolution rate determinations in the USB as well as in the transfer system. And we also included the uh, Nasonex uh, product that uh, was on the market. And you see that there was really a distinct difference in dissolution rate, not surprisingly, um, between the two different formulations, um, MF1 and MF2. And one of those formulations was quite similar to the dissolution profile that we uh, observed, observed for Nasonex. Uh, again, uh, USB and transfer system behaved adequately, very, very similar. Um, we also did for those formulations a pharmacokinetic study. And uh, you can see that also the pharmacokinetics between those two, uh, those two formulations differed significantly. Um, the formulation MF2 had a much, much smaller area under the curve. So that was the formulation that was dissolving more slowly. And the reason for the PK difference there is just that uh, if something dissolves in the nose more slowly, there's more time for the ciliary clearance to just kick it out of the lung, uh, out of the nose. And so there will be less material be absorbed systemically. Um, so this, this study just showed that solution tests as, as well as PK are sensitive to differences in the uh, particle size distribution. Uh, and so they probably will give very valid information for making bioequivalent decisions on those formulations. And uh, they might represent alternatives to MDIS. Uh, these are just some more results where we looked at the uh, generic uh, Flonase uh, formulations that we could get from from local pharmacies and uh, indeed and, and some I think were also done from Europe and you see really that they behave very very similar so uh, the dissolution profiles of, of generics and the innovator drug are very very similar. Uh, we also looked at the dissolution profile of a range of, of nasal sprays. Uh, and, and you see uh, with different APIs from fluticasone to 
uh, prime similar to the knight. So, and you see that their dissolution behavior is very, very different. Again, we saw those differences, same differences for the USB apparatus and the transfer. Maybe the transfer system was a little better for the, the yellow drug, the nasocord, which was dissolving very, very fast. Um, so the transfer system still was able to <coughs> slow this dissolution process somewhat down because we were working under non sync conditions, under those conditions also. Um, and what we then tried to do was an IV IVC. So we looked at, on one hand, the percent dissolved and compared it with the percent absorbed from uh, published PK studies. And you see that for the transfer system, you've got a relatively good correlation. So it's emphasizing again that the dissolution rate is probably the rate limiting step for the absorption process in the nose. Uh, the USP pedal method was not as good. Okay, so let's just conclude. Um, so I, I think after you validated a dissolution method, it really doesn't uh, matter that much whether you use the USP or the transfer system. The transfer system probably represents more for the lung, the, the central portions of the lung, uh, where the drug dissolves under non sync conditions. Um, we got with both methods relatively good in vitro and vivo correlations. And, and I believe that those dissolution tests are important on one hand to make, maybe make regulatory decisions uh, on, on equivalent, but they also can guide your formulation development. Um, so if you already see early on that there are differences in, in dissolution rate, it probably doesn't make sense to make a PK study and um, maybe even a PD study. You really want to get first uh, those in vitro characteristics similar and, and you have much, much higher probability of a success. And I think for that, uh, besides uh, deposition studies, MMED and NGI studies, uh, dissolution tests for some of those drugs uh, will provide you with pretty important information. And with that, I really thank you. Um, just want to also acknowledge all the people who were involved. Um, all the folks from the FDA for long, long, long hours of discussion and phone calls and um, optimization of the results and, and studies that we did. And then the team of, of MS Consulting uh, who were involved in some of the dissolution experiments. And then uh, Jürgen Bolita, my colleague um, and students and Larry Winner who did statistics um, and yeah, so that was it. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. So today, my talk will be on considerations for conducting more realistic aerodynamic particle size distribution testing for orally inhaled drug products. So my disclaimer, uh, this presentation reflects the views of the author and should not be construed to represent FDA's views or policies. So as mentioned in the previous talks, um, um, the weight of evidence approach for OIDP's um, Bioequivalence bio recommendations include a uh, weight of evidence approach. Um, in addition to formulation sameness and device similarity, uh, the weight of evidence approach uh, includes in vitro BE studies, pharmacokinetic um, BE studies, clinical, comparative clinical endpoint um, pharmacodynamic BE studies, or as is the um, topic of today's and this symposium, is alternative BE approaches. So some suggested studies as provided in PSGs on um, solution MBIs uh, for alternative B approaches include uh, characterization of emitted sprays via velocity profiles and evaporation rates, 
morphology imaging comparisons of the full range of residual drug particle sizes. More realistic APSC testing using representative mouth throat models and inhalation profiles. Dissolution, as was just discussed by Dr. Bielski and Dr. Hawkhouse. Uh, quantitative methods and modeling, um, such as physiologically based PK and computational fluid dynamics studies, and also alternative PKBE studies. And as mentioned, the focus of today's talk will be more realistic APSC testing. So for compendial methods, uh, in vitro APSC testing allows for drug specific particle size comparison of formulations. And as an example here, um, we have the NGI, the next generation impactor with the um, US Pharmacopeia um, induction port and to be used with this square wave as shown here in the plot. So however, the current recommended square wave testing provides limited information about clinical performance or the variability of lung delivery. So in vitro APSD testing with realistic mouth throat models and representative inhalation profiles, it may be more predictive of in vivo deposition. And as an example here, again, I have the NGI um, attached to a mixing inlet, um, which is attached to a mouth throat model and to be used with these um, representative inhalation profiles. And conventional APST testing uh, with the USP induction port has been shown to underpredict mouth throat deposition and would thus overpredict lung deposition. And results from more realistic APSC testing may be compared to the drug deposition reported in clinical literature to assess which in vitro method, uh, for example, mouth throat models, um, sizes, or inhalation profiles, offer the best in vitro to in vivo correlations. So this table shown here um, compares the side view, the internal volume, and the internal geometry of currently commercially available mouth throat models. So the first set, the Oral Pharyngeal Consortium, um, their model was developed based on um, MRI scans of individual, healthy individuals inhaling through a mouth, different mouthpieces. So since, um, and if this, they selected their models, the small, medium, and large, based on um, mouth throat deposition, irrespective of internal volume. So you'll see that the internal volume for the, uh, the medium OPC is 91.7, which is the highest of the three models. And since these are um, individual sc scans of individual healthy subjects, uh, you can see the internal geometries are very different between the three models. Well, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University's um, mouth throat models, they were developed based on um, volume, var uh, volume variations in typical adult patients. And so uh, they're representative of the fifth, the fiftieth, and the ninety-fifth percentile of typical adult patients or adult subjects. And the Alberta idealized throat was developed based on typical patient uh, um, geometries, uh, based off of CT scans and um, anatomy tests, texts, and uh, anatomy and textbooks. Um, and the U.S. Pharmacopeia, the USP induction port, is a much simpler 90-degree bend. So as an example, um, this is an experimental test setup for the APSD, which may um, be, which may have an example or a test setup similar to this. So here I have, again, the uh, next generation impactor as an example. It's connected to a vacuum at constant flow. And connected to this is a, a mixing inlet, such as a Nafel mixing inlet. And um, introduction of dilution air um, maintain, at constant flow rate will help ensure that uh, the NGI is um, operated at a constant flow. And to the mixing inlet, um, a realistic mouth throat model is connected. And to this test setup, a breathing simulator, simulator will be connected, um, which will um, uh, provide the inhalation profile, the relevant inhalation profile. So now I'll discuss um, some uh, outcomes from Gadufa funded research on realistic mouth throat models and inhalation profiles. So in this first study, this was a, a grant um, with Virginia Commonwealth University led by Dr. Michael Hindle um, to explore the influence of mouth throat models and inhalation profiles on total lung dose. So here, total lung dose in vitro, TLD in vitro, uh, was defined as the drug mass exiting the mouth throat model. And APSD, TLD in vitro, was the size distribution of drug mass exiting the mouth throat model. 
And here, um, the, it's the same diagram from earlier or picture from earlier where it has the NGI um, connected to the Nafel mixing inlet um, and uh, realistic mouth throat model. And this study looked at eight different mouth throat models, the three sizes of the OPC model, the three sizes of the VCU model, the um, upper ideal, idealized throat, as well as the USP injection port. So the inhalation profiles used were simulated based on reported range of trained volunteers. And so for the DPI um, drug product that contained budesonide, the medium um, inhalation profile was based off of um, literature values for peak inspiratory flow and mean um, inhaled volume. And then the weak and strong inhalation profiles were um, simulated from the two standard deviations from the medium profile. And then typical um, constant flows were used for the MDI, 30 liters per minute plus or minus 15, as these were believed to be typical flow rates. So for uh, in this plot, I, I'm showing um, the mean total lung dose in, vi in vitro of budesonide um, for the different mouth throat models that were studied. Um, the error bars here shown are standard deviations. And for DPI, which used the weak, medium, and strong realistic inhalation profiles, um, overall it was shown that the variance was mostly due to the flow conditions. So you can see um, that uh, for each of the mouth throat models, you can see the weak inhalation profile um, resulted in the lowest mean uh, TLD in vitro, um, while the strongest inhalation profile had the highest mean TLD. And across the VCU models, the total lung dose in vitro appeared to be less influenced by the inhalation profile compared to the OPC models. And so the mouth throat model type may, uh, can be influential. Similarly, um, for the drug pot or the MDI containing albuterol, um, the plot here shows uh, the mean total lung dose in vitro across the different mouth throats studied. And for um, this suspension based MDI, overall the variance was mostly due to the mouth throat models. And across the VCU models, the total lung dose in vitro appeared to be less influenced by the flow compared to the OPC models. And again, mouth models can be influential. So in this plot, again, looking at the um, DPI with um, uh, budesonide, the total lung dose um, percent as a percent of meter dose here is plotted for each of the mouth throat model groups. So here um, for the VCU, this includes the small, medium, and large mouth throat models, as well as the um, weak, medium, and strong inhalation profiles. And the same goes with the OPC. And the AIT includes all three inhalation profiles, as does the USP. Also on this plot is the in vivo data, and in this case, it's medium and median and the range data that is found that was found in literature. Um, the dashed lines represent the the range of the in vivo data. And so the uh, the four mouth throat model groups um, produce similar in vitro lung deposition to the in vivo data. And similarly for uh, the albuterol MDI which used um, constant flow rates. Um, the data was plotted similarly, um, but for the in vivo data, this is actually um, individual data with the means uh, shown in the solid line. And for the um, suspension-based MDI, the VCO models appear to produce the most comparable range to the in vivo data, while the Alberta idealized throw and the USP models were uh, resulted in overprediction. So overall, um, from this study, product-specific results suggest the need to include various mouth throat models, um, such as types or sizes, um, and inhalation profiles to capture patient variability. So in the second study, um, it was a collaboration between um, Office of Research and Standards in OGD and the Office of Testing and Research in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality to study the influence of mouth throat models on solution and suspension MDIs. In this study, um, APSC testing was performed with the Anderson Cascade Impactor, the ACI, at a constant flow rate of 28.3 liters per minute. So they looked at um, two drug products, a solution MDI with beclomethasone and a suspension MDI with fluticasone propionate. And in this study, um, six different models or mouth throat models were studied. The USP induction port, the AIT, 
um, this large, medium, and small VCU model in plastic resin and the um, medium VCU model in metal. So here it shows the, the plot. This is a plot of the mean FPF, less than five micron values um, for across the different uh, Malthrop models for um, beclomethazone in yellow and fluticasone propionate in blue. And the error bars are standard deviations. So when compared to in vivo data, um, the uh, solution MDI, um, the in vivo data show with, uh, showed that it was about 59 plus or minus 9% um, uh, fine particle fraction. Um, and then it's 50 to 60% in healthy volunteers. Uh, this followed well with um, compared well, sorry, compared well with the uh, in, uh, in vitro data. However, when we looked at the suspension based MDI and, and compared it with um, one clinical study in 22 asthmatic or in, in asthmatics, 22% um, fine particle fraction, which was shown comparable to the VCU large, medium and small throats. However, it was um, the in vitro data for the USP induction port, the AIT mouth model and the VCU medium in metal were over predicted. So from the study, suspension-based MDIs, like those containing fluticasone and propionate, appear to be much more sensitive to variations in mouth throat model, models versus um, solution-based MDIs, such as um, bicomethasone MDI. And overall, MDI performance, as evaluated by the realistic APSD studies, it could be influenced by many factors, uh, such as the type of formulation, the geometry, the shape, internal space volume, and the material used to make these models. In our third study, um, this was a contract with the University of Florida, um, led by Dr. Gunther Hockhaus and Jurgen Belita, um, which looked at um, additional factors that may influence APSC and MDIs. So our next speaker, Dr. Spenson, will go into more detail with this study, so I'll just touch on it briefly. In this study, um, 10 different mouth throat models were explored. Um, the USP, um, in metal and plastic, the AIT in metal and plastic, the three sizes of the OPC model, small, medium, and large, and the three sizes of the VCU model in small, medium, and large. Two inhalation profiles, or three inhalation profiles were looked at, um, strong, medium, and weak, and these were um, just simulated as described in Delvedia Del et al. And uh, the third factor that was looked at was uh, the model quoting, um, either silicone or breach, um, another factor was the mouth throat model insertion angle, either normal or tilted at 25 degrees from uh, with respect to the mouth throat. And uh, the last factor was MDI firing points, either 0.2 seconds or 0.5 seconds after the start of the inhalation profile. And three um, drug products were looked at, um, two suspension MDIs, Flovent HFA and Simbacort, and also one solution uh, MDI, Atrovent HFA. So in this plot shows the FP, uh, fine particle fraction um, for all of the mouth throat models. Um, for Flovent HFA, um, the two um, APIs in Simicor, Promoterol, Fumarate, um, FF, and then Budesonide, BUD, and Atrovent HFA. So overall significant differences in the fine particle fraction less than five microns were obtained with the different mouth throat models and then other factors as, as can be seen by the spread of the data. So it was noticed that there was an increasing trend in the fine particle fraction less than five microns observed with the small, medium and large mouth throat models for Simbacort um, for both FF and Budesonide. But this wasn't seen with either the Flovent HFA or the Atrovent HFA. Um, uh, ADA square analysis was also done um, across the factors, and it was shown that the mouth throat model had the most significant, was the most significant factor, followed by the inhalation profiles, and uh, to a lesser extent, the firing point. And so the highlighted um, data points here are um, shown um, when all other, when all the other factors were held constant. So this can be seen that uh, for the strong um, uh, inhalation profile, it was a higher fine particle fraction um, for both the 
semicord um, FF and then the atrium and HFA. So overall, realistic APSC testing should consider the effect of different experimental conditions, particularly the type of mouth throat model, inhalation profile, and MDI firing point. So some considerations for more realistic APSD testing. So what have we learned from um, our, the studies that I just touched on briefly? So with regards to less uh, method development, overall, the realistic APSD results are product specific. And both formula or and formulation factors, as well as uh, multiple study method parameters, um, such as inhalation profiles, mouth throat model materials, and MDI firing point can affect the results. We also have some ongoing questions. So are there optimal study design parameters for each dosage form? And also, does the method parameter selection depend on how realistic APSC study will be used? Either is it, will it be a standalone method or will it be input for in silico methods? Also, we want to know our considerations for assessing um, patient variability. So selection of mouth throat models and inhalation profiles should consider how these will correlate with in vivo performance. Um, as an example, I have plotted on the right um, the in vivo oropharynx and lung deposition as a percent delivered dose of beclomethazone in asthmatic adult, adults. Um, and then in vitro data should target the in vivo range for a good correlation. So ideally, inhalation profiles should be based on patient population, since the comparative clinical endpoint and pharmacodynamic study is con conducted on patient population. And we still have ongoing questions with this as well. And first one being, is there an optimal method for selecting which mouth throat type or size and inhalation profile to use? Is in vivo data always needed or can other information be used? And also is the mouth throat model and type or size more critical to capture for evaluating patient variability as compared to the inhalation profile? Does this matter based on the dosage form? A third consideration would be the appropriate statistical methods. So for establishing bioequivalence, um, a realistic APSD performance metrics that may be considered or, or maybe um, involved would be total lung dose, um, the mouth throat deposition, the fine particle fraction less than five microns and, or the impactor size mass. Um, study size would consider number of units and number of batches. And the statistical approach could possibly be population bioequivalence analysis. And this could be either single analysis based on pool data or multiple analysis based on the mouth throat inhalation profile combinations. And we have ongoing questions as well with the statistical methods. Uh, such as what realistic APSC parameters are most correlated with in vivo performance and what statistical method is appropriate. Lastly, is there a minimum study size that is sufficient for establishing bioequivalence? Does this depend on the study purpose, either standalone method or input for in silico methods? So in summary, uh, realistic in vitro APSC testing is currently part of the recommended alternative to a CC EP, the Comparative Clinical Endpoint BE study approach for solution MDIs. Compared to current compendial methods, realistic APSC can provide a better prediction of deposition of inhaled particles in the lungs and capture patient variability. Research has demonstrated the importance of product-specific realistic APSCs for DPIs and MDIs. And as um, touched on briefly, uh, the formulation type, the, IP, the inhalation profiles, the mouth throat models, including model material, and the MDI firing point have been shown to affect the test results. So there are still ongoing questions regarding realistic APSD method development, patient variability assessment, and the appropriate statistical method to use to establish bioequivalence. I'd like to uh, acknowledge all of the, um, coll my colleagues and then our external collaborators for all the work that went into this. Thank you.
So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Morten Svensson, and um, I'm going to talk about uh, the study that Susan was um, touching upon, and it's about the realistic APSD testing uh, on MDIs, uh, in which we have varied a lot of different factors. The work is sponsored by FDA, and it's managed by uh, Günther's group in Florida. So a very high level and, and simplistic uh, view of the study. We have a different of throat uh, models. <clears throat> this is the factor groups here that Susan was talking about. The throat models, the inhalation profiles, different actuation timings and the coating type and also the inhalation angle. Um, this was uh, exposed onto three different PMDIs, two suspension ones and one solution. And then we, we did those testing in the, the, um, the NDI equipped with a mixing inlet, uh, with the lung simulator, and also with a mechanical hand that is not really illustrated on, on this picture, but it fires off the PMDI at the um, various and optimal, optimal timings on the inhalation profile. And what we want to see is really um, the variability that comes out uh, on this, for, of these products when we do this kind of factor exposures. Um, Susan was, was uh, touching on this and it's not, not much, much more to say that we have a bunch of different factors here and I will go through them uh, one by one soon. Um, six of these 10 mouth throat models was commercially available. This six here to the, to the right, the Alberta idealized throat, and of course the USP. Then we did two plastic one of the Alberta and of the USP. And uh, the, the USB was quite simple to do in plastic because all the drawings are available. Here on the Alberta one, we, we did a 3D scan and then uh, manufactured a plastic one. Uh, some details about the inhalation profiles. Um, as Susan said, it is constructed of the, from the work done by Delvadi and Byron. It has these kind of shapes um, illustrated here. And um, the design and values of the, the profiles was discussed together within the group with the FDA and also with the, the Florida uh, persons. So we, we ended up with these three profiles. And another factor group is the two fire points. Uh, we selected also by some discussion, I can say, 0.2 and 0.5 seconds into the inhalation profiles after the start of it. And it's about here. Some data on the profiles, it's spanning from 30 to 90 in, in peak inspiratory flow. The time to PIF, it's a little bit different. We have a stronger acceleration and steeper ramp profile for the strong one compared to the weak one. And then the volume spans from two to, to four liters. Another thing to consider is what kind of airflow the, the, the inhaler is fired off at. And here we also discussed, um, and, and we, we conclude that we, we would like to have a, a, also a span here ranging from six liters per minute up to 70 liters per minute. You can, you can see that with these small stars here on the profiles. And then the inhaler insertion angle. The commercial throats, they come with a certain natural angle. If you just mold or construct a, a adapter, you get what, what, what that is, and um, the OPC and the USB throat is uh, horizontal mouth opening. 
the VCU uh, points upwards and the Alberta throat points downward, about 25 degrees, both of them. So we, we, we did some silicon moldings uh, to construct different, um, a second tilted angle that, that are different from the natural one. So for the VCU and Alberta, we did horizontal inhaler position. And for the OPC and the USB, we did 25 degrees downward. You can see illustration here that this is the VCU throat. And here, this is horizontal position. And this is the natural position. If you just continue outside here with, with the adapter. The coating, uh, we tested two different types of substrates. And uh, this is the interior of the throat, of course. The first one, one of them is silicon based and we solubilize silicon in hexane and allow the hexane to evaporate. And then the, at least in our world, the classical one, Brie 35 with glycerol and uh, uh, ethanol as well. It's a more water soluble solution. In all testing, the NDI caps were coated with the Brie 35 glycerol solution. Some more details uh, regarding the, <clears throat> the testing was that um, six different, six, six actuations from the NDI was, test, uh, was actuated, uh, and that is for, for all MDIs. The temperature and RH was uh, decently controlled. Um, and the MDIs was primed and reprimed according to the patient insert leaflet. We, uh, we had some work also to synchronize the mechanical hand with the, um, the start of the inhalation profile in order to generate the, the fire points, 0.2 and 0.5 seconds. And um, since the mixing inlet me methodology that was applied here, it, it has a constant flow in the NDI while then, then you generate the inhalation profiles through the inhaler. And as a general rule, we kept the NDI flow about 10 liters over the PIF values of the inhalation profiles. And as Susan said, um, we, uh, we tested the Flovan Symbicort, which is a suspension one, and the Atrovent, that is a solution-based MDI. So if you, if you make this testing and you do a triplicate testing, um, you, you end up with 720 NDIs for each product. We, made a reduced uh, test scheme down to 96 NDIs. So that means that we tested 14% of all the, all the combinations. And then after somewhat 300 NDIs, the study was done. Um, I have chosen in, in, in this presentation to, to present the data as a eta square value. Um, and that is when you have a design reduced test design, it, it needs more or less always a statistical evaluation in the end. And eta square value is a quite convenient one because it rep represents the fraction of the total variation in the measurements that are explained by a defined factor after controlling for all other factors in the model meaning that you can easily compare the, the, how much each factor is adding to the variability, uh, more or less on the same row. The strict definition is in the bottom here. So some results then, the eta square values. We have the different MDIs, the products out here to the left. Then I'm taking out three different uh, result parameters from the NDI testing, fine particle fraction, lung dose, and MMAD. 
and then you have the, the factors up here. And according to praxis, if you have a eta square value higher than 0 0.06, it's a medium effect. And it's over 0 0.14, it's a very large effect. And what is quite very clear from a, from a table like this is that the mouth throat models do produce the most variability in, in a test like this. If we look on the, the the suspension ones here, it, it is has extremely high effect on the variability coming out from experiment like this. You have some effect on from the inhalation profile on Flovent on the lung dose, and you have it on MMAD from for the Symbicort here, the Formoterol and the Budesonide. But if we look on the the Atrovent, which is a solution-based one, there is a more uh, quite more effect from the inhalation profile, more or less comparable to what was uh, coming from the mouth throat models. And also we see that there is a slight effect from the firing point um, as well, but nothing from the coating type and nothing from the insertion angle. We take this data and plot it instead, perhaps a bit more easier to see. So we, if we use the, take the total dose, that is the dose that survives the throat, at the square value on the y-axis and the factors here. If we look on the Symbicort, uh, the two APIs there, it is completely unaffected of all other factors than the mouth-throat model. Uh, that, that's, I mean, giving all variability in that kind of testing. The Flovent has some sort of effect <clears throat> from the inhalation profile, but still most of it comes from the, from the mouth-throat model. And then the atrovent that has, has a more flattened curve, and we see that the firing point also uh, rises a bit there. And you can do this on this kind of, of plotting and evaluation of many of the, the parameters. I'm showing MMAD here as well. And, and here, um, again, lo lots of variability comes from the mouth throat models, surprisingly much. So there is a difference between the suspension and the solution. So wh why is that then? And, and the reason for these kind of differences can, can be many, of course. But if we look on the stage deposition from the, the NDI, we have the, the orange one here that's coming from the Symbicort, for Motorol and the Budesonide, and then we have the Flovent, and then very to the, to the bottom or to the end, uh, later stages in the NDI, we have a quite characteristic profile from the Atrovent that really is smeared out in, in the bottom here. So that can be one reason for, for the different behavior, but, um, at the same point, you should look for plume angle differences, plume front velocity, perhaps the ballistic portion that comes out, and also the dose duration, how, how during how long time is the dose uh, generated in the, in the inhaler. So let's take up the, the lung dose data. And now all factors are included in this plot. And I decided to do lung dose percent of delivered dose uh, in order to get it on the same plot. And you can see that this is um, nicely showing the efficacy of the meter dose versus the variability. And, um, and you can see that budesonide and formoterol, they are nicely following each other, uh, suggesting that they are co-produced in some way. Then we have the Flovent here, and then the Apatropio, the Atrovent. And um, one can think of this that it is an indication of some sort of patient variability. In our case, it, N was 32 um, in this kind of, of, of testing. So it's, this, this can be a 
very good way to see it. It's some sort of patient variability. The same thing, but MMA instead. And uh, you should uh, bear in mind that this is the MMA that actually survives uh, and getting down after the throat. <clears throat> so, um, and Atovent is clearly having a very low MMA D and not shown here, it has a very strange GST as well. Some practical comments about this study. It, it was indeed complex from a practical point of view. So we, it must be doable in the lab, um, be performed in a reasonable time frame, but also avoid impossible sources uh, and minimizes unwanted variability. So we did some sort of uh, rules here or tricks. We, we, we used the same models, 10 models uh, throughout the study. And we used one analyst, believe it or not, an analyst can be different. Um, so one analyst was, was handling all the testing. Um, the MDI can also be different. Um, and also we randomize it, of course. And then lastly, but not least, the cleaning and recoating of a throat is the most time consuming step. So we never test the same throat model twice in a row. Conclusions, um, we, we say again that most of our ability from, from, from this testing comes from the mouth throat models. It, it's strikingly much variability comes from that. For the solution based product, we also find that the inhalation profiles was um, adding to the variability. Firepoint added some minor effects and the coating type and the inhalation angle did not affect the results at all, more or less. We have, of course, a manuscript um, in preparation ongoing here. Finally, some, some general thoughts about this kind of testing. As standard MDI is technically challenging due to the actuation versus inhalation profile sync. You need, you need to work on the synchronization there to fire it off at the right place. High resistance DPIs, um, it, due to the resistance, you, you get the large difference between the, the target, target profile and the replayed profile. So you need to work on that before you, they are equal. Breath actuated MDIs are, are very easy, uh, no sync required and low device resistance. So it takes a, a shorter time to uh, start up those kind of experiments. We can do this for nebulizers as well, but then we need humidified pressurized air and probably also a cooled impactor. Consider to replace some of the full NGI testing we just filter after the throat is cost efficient way to uh, generate a lots of different lung doses. Thus, you can, you can try and test um, many more factors. Finally, the um, often for low resistance DPI, you, you get from the clinic uh, often PIF values that are higher than 100 liters, which is the highest calibrated flow for the NDI. So I, I think we have a need for an NDI or an impactor that has calibrated cutoffs uh, higher than 100. And using the, the impactor for um, high speed um, or high flow during a longer time can generate bounce and, and the operators need to check this. Finally, uh, the team uh, uh, that has been very uh, pivotal during these uh, studies and not least the discussions. So thank you very much. Thank you, that was a very nice presentation. And I wanna thank, uh, this is Mark and Luke. Um, I'm the director for the Division of Therapeutic Performance. And this is 
a, a prime area that we're moving forward in this year, the inhaled drug products. So we wanted to um, have this session where we can uh, lay the, uh, have a lay of the land of where we are at this moment. Um, I, I'm putting together some um, closing remarks for today before we break out into our small group sessions. So um, we're gonna wait to see what's going on in the other room. Do we know if their other room is on time? Great. So I'll, I'll just keep talking here and give a little pep talk for our folks here. You guys did fantastic in, in, this, in our little breakout session here. Um, and I, I thought the presentations were really uh, spot on, as they say in, in uh, north of London, right? All right, hello. So um, we had a fantastic day one of our two day uh, session, uh, uh, thing, our two day discussion uh, set up by our colleagues in, in the Center for Research and Complex Generics. Uh, I wanted to start off the closing remarks by, uh, for today by thanking our organizers, um, all of you who uh, worked so hard to put these um, uh, this session together. Uh, this is, given this is day one, we are hoping for equally, if not more successful day two. I uh, also, also want to thank the day one speakers. Um, my takeaways for today, first of all, the, the title says it all. The, uh, we started off with considerations for comparative clinical endpoint and pharmacodynamic BE studies for these generic orally inhaled drug products. Uh, we heard uh, from opening remarks uh, from uh, Anna and, and Rob. Uh, the key focus there being uh, that we are in the throes of developing more efficient BE approaches and continue to target that as our, our uh, ongoing goal. Uh, of note, we're just at the beginning. Rob pointed out that only 12% of uh, NDAs here and um, so far uh, have uh, Andes, uh, that's four out of 33, it was his latest count. Uh, we uh, uh, explored a little bit about what has been done in this area with regards to comparative clinical endpoint studies um, and the whole approach to how do we measure bioequivalence in this area for, uh, for these oral inhaled drug products. Uh, there was a focus in on the weight of evidence approach the weight of evidence approach is somewhat complicated, as you can see. When whenever someone presents this, they usually present a pie chart and say, "Hey, these are all the different areas that we're looking at: the in vitro uh, performance, the uh, the equivalent um, uh, systemic uh, levels in in using in vivo PK, having uh, equivalent uh, uh, delivery, uh, local delivery." having as device sameness and Q1, Q2, or Q1, Q2, Q3 sameness for, for the products. Um, given the complexity of putting together a weight of evidence approach, it's, it's no wonder that it's really difficult uh, to come up with a comprehensive development program for these. And uh, we try to help these along by having our product specific guidance outline, hey, this is where you, we need you to look at and, and in order for you to have a strategic approach to developing uh, your generic products for specific NDA products in this area. Um, I wanted to uh, point out to thank uh, Stephanie um, Sukup for uh, reminding us why it's so difficult to do the comparative BE studies, the FEV1 studies with spirometry. Uh, as we saw uh, from Stephanie's talk, it's uh, complex. There's a lot of do's and don'ts uh, to those. And any um, minor deviation from uh, having a really good study can lead to a problematic study. So um, you then have questions from FDA about, hey, why did you do this and this? And, um, and that leads to potentially uh, problems with study powering, etc. There's room for innovation in that area, as we saw from our colleagues in uh, in the uh, DQMMM and 
um, others in, who uh, have weighed in on, hey, these are things that we can do a little bit better in, in identifying populations for studying with, with these clinical models. But at the same time, is there a fundamental flaw for, for doing DE with these comparative clinical endpoint studies? Is there, can we do better in those areas? And that's the second part of our uh, sessions here, the alternatives to. Uh, the alternatives to, we had uh, some really good talks uh, from, and aside from our breakout sessions, but leading into the breakout sessions, um, um, my team leader, Brian, uh, gave a, a really nice summary on uh, these are the pathways by which we're, we're looking to uh, attack this, this problem. Um, I want to uh, point out that uh, there, there are a variety of takeaway points that um, I put it in my notes. I know you all have, some of you have taken notes, but some of the notes that I put down here are uh, one um, to optimize BE approaches. Uh, we've taken the notion that products are somewhat unique. So we have product specific approaches to each of the, um, for, for the BE approaches. Yes, there, there's room for standardization. And I think it's really important to have some standardized methodologies um, for approaching uh, these, but they, how you implement those could be product specific depending on certain features of certain products, what the API is, what the excipients are, et cetera. Uh, also optimize B approaches can evolve. They're not necessarily static as technology develops. And we've learned that over the years as pointed out by uh, our industry colleagues and our FDA um, folks uh, here at this meeting. Uh, these, this evolution uh, is gradual, but we also know that evolution uh, takes steps. There, there, there's leaps and bounds, and then there's like gradual evolution. So um, as we uh, evolve in our approaches, it's important to uh, take a look at where we are and provide advice uh, at certain milestone points. And so this is what FDA tries to do. And we put these out in updates to our revised guidance, uh, revised product specific guidances. If, if you know, we rarely finalize our product specific guidances because uh, technology continues to evolve. Um, so these are based on our research, our understanding of current research and, uh, and also what direction we believe research is taking us uh, to help us to put uh, the assessment of biocovins into perspective. Uh, I also want to say that there, there are some additional benefits for standardization. So if we develop standardized technologies, uh, it, it often helps to, uh, by having a, a record of certain products, for example, reference products that have the risk of being taken off the market. So if, if we can capture certain uh, in vitro characteristics of those reference products, that then leaves a, a record of what it's like, uh, what it is, and potentially um, in the future, that's something that we can use uh, uh, as a marker for uh, looking at other products that come down the line, whether it be new reference products or um, a new um, uh, or a, copies of those reference products or comparing other products to those products. Um, I want to say in the clinical space, there is a, a lot of leeway with regards to how products are used. And that was pointed out by several people that the, the use of um, many of these products were, were at this very uh, shallow dose response curve, right? So when you, when you get to uh, the dose delivery, 50 versus 100 versus 200, the amount of drug that you actually get into the drug uh, into your system and your uh, clinical response to that is a fairly um, how, how do you say this it? Uh, it it doesn't change that much in response to how much more drug you get in potentially so our where we are at that and considerations for uh, sameness but it um, may be taken into account but i also point out that there may be certain diseases that are um, targets for these pro products that where those things do matter, where maybe that dose response curve is useful for certain um, mild patients, but for certain patients with more severe 
uh, disease, they, that's where those, uh, the, the dose may actually come into play as more important. So that's, that's the other point that was um, brought up in some of the talks. And I think in the modeling session, there was some discussion about um, cystic uh, fibrosis, interstitial fibrosis, where things can, uh, those sorts of things uh, might become important. Um, I also want to point out that certain aspects of what we are measuring, uh, they're, they're beginning to be, or they have been of sufficient detail that uh, they, they, they may easily traverse uh, what is meaningful, what are meaningful differences. Uh, and so this is, this is another aspect to what we need to consider as we start looking more and more into um, what, what kind of measurements we want to pull out to target bioequivalence. Uh, so I, again, um, I want to keep this short so that we can have time to get into the next session. I know we're running a little late. Um, so I'm going to end my talk here. And I, again, I want to thank all, this, all the speakers um, for providing very insightful, uh, useful knowledge for us to consider as we move forward in, this, in, this endeavor, in our endeavors in this space. Thank you so much.